Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger, and on this episode of Better Off, we're talking with the famous podcast, The 404's hosts, Jeff Bacalar and Russ Frushtick. A lot of the digital assistant stuff, uh, your Alexas, your Google Homes, the Echo, that kind of stuff, I think is going to play a major role uh, in people's first experience with some kind of artificial intelligence. I think Uber has a lot of baggage in terms of their brand and stuff like that. I mean, I was just in San Francisco and I literally did not use Uber once. I used Lyft the whole time. And a lot of that has to do with their brand and, and their perception that they're putting out there. And it's it's pretty gross. Welcome to the Better Off podcast sponsored by Betterment, the largest independent online financial advisor. Okay, so here's a problem. When you book interviews and you just try to slam out a bunch of them, you can't run them all so quickly. And then some of the material becomes slightly dated. But that said, here's something kind of cool. We recorded this interview with my tech gurus. This is Russ and Jeff. And we were talking about Snap, which is the parent organization of Snapchat. And at the time, we were talking about the IPO because it was worth gazillion dollars. But then in the ensuing weeks, what has happened is that Snap shares fell below the initial public offering price. So the IPO price was 17 and shares are at about 15. And part of this is because really amazingly, Morgan Stanley, which was the lead underwriter of the deal, meaning the bank that decides the IPO and the market value. Anyway, the analysts for Morgan Stanley downgraded it. So that doesn't really bode well. And what has happened is now everyone's like, oh, my God, the snap is no longer going to be relevant because Instagram has a new thing called Instagram stories and Facebook's going to eat their lunch and all this stuff. Meanwhile, on July 30th, the insiders of Snap, the parent of Snapchat, are actually unlocked, meaning that company insiders can sell off shares That is interesting because we're going to wait to see whether or not they do that. And if they do that, we could see Snap fall even further. Don't go crazy yet. I mean, George Soros owns 1.6 million shares of Snap. Daniel Loeb has 2.4 million. So it's not going away. It's just that therein lies one of the big downsides of investing in an IPO. You just don't know. Anyway, we're going to talk about Snap and a lot of other things on the technology landscape. Stay tuned. Here's the interview with Russ and Jeff. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Okay, it's time for the interview segment of Better Off and the shoes on the other foot this time. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yes. Here I have the formidable team from CNET's 404 podcast. It is Mr. Jeff Bacalar, Mr. Russ Frushtick. Hello. You got that right. Were you worried about getting that I right? I was because I thought I was putting extra letters nah, in there. No, you crushed it. Uh, let me just say that Russ is the editorial director of Live Video for Polygon, which, according to Jeff, is the Internet's premier video game and culture website. It's true. G- Thank Jeff, you, Jeff. <laughs> is the senior editor reviews gaming video and <laughs> look at this. Print He's out. also regularly featured on CBS and the mm-hmm. streaming product at CBS News. The 404 is the second longest second? running podcast. Why'd on, you say second? It says it on the website. Get out. Let me see that. That's uh, on a, what? Like on CNET? It says on CNET's podcast. What it's the longer? second longest running podcast. No, it, no, you misread that. Oh, uh, yeah? It says the site's longest running oh, podcast. You editorialize. Oh, you need glasses. The, you need wow. I'm wearing them. <laughs> the site's longest running <laughs> Podcast, podcast, yeah. ever. ever. So you've been, you We've are. Done it, we we're the longest podcast ever. It's not just CNET. It's ever. Um, Is that true? It's the longest running on CNET. Longest running on the internet. I'm not so sure. Yeah, okay. I don't think so. <laughs> uh, all right. You know, we start our program with a question to every interviewee. Okay. You mm-hmm. ready? Yeah. Pressure's Ooh. on. Uh oh, hit us. We have not Russ, been prepped. What is the best financial decision you've ever made? Oof. Holy cow. Cutting deep. Stump the DJ. Now, there is an answer. It could be, I've never made a good financial decision. <laughs> I think that is a possible answer. Um, best financial decision I've ever made. Um, I would say, hmm. Um, you know, it's weird because 
I feel like fi- financial decisions and mental health decisions run in, are in the same vein, and it's not always like this is better for my overall bottom line if it's better for my life. So, for example, I was I was in a job two years ago that I was absolutely miserable with. Um, the pay was great, and everything was working out great. And I basically looked at all my numbers, my savings, everything that I had, and figured out financially, I can afford to quit this job that's hmm. making me absolutely miserable. And um, yeah, I haven't looked back. So, so that was a great that's decision. A that's, I think that's an awesome decision. Thank and you. you know what? But but what's also striking is that you had saved money. I know. Because I'm like, a... if you don't have the savings, yeah, sure, it's such a drag because you are robbed of this opportunity, and you have no mm-hmm. choice. You feel like uh, mm-hmm. I hate that feeling. Jeff, what's the best financial decision you've made so far besides listening to me for the? 15 different things you've asked me about in well, the last that, bunch of years. Those are all connected, though. Anything yeah. wise that I've done has been a, a direct result of your advice. <laughs> I think that goes without saying. It has been true that there's been uh, sometimes a, a call. Not a text. A text. A got, frantic text. Got time to talk? <laughs> question, question mark. Question mark. Question question mark. <laughs> Need so, you it's like a booty text. What do you think? So, what do you think is the best financial decision you've made so far? Uh, mine is is pure dumb luck. Maybe not dumb luck, but the timing of it was luck. Buying was the car. Buying, yeah. buying a condo yeah. in, in Hoboken. In Hoboken. Yeah. Uh, at the bottom of the market. You didn't mean to, but we didn't mean to. Just... But that was where we we're at in life. And, and now... sometimes. You, you, you cash in. And uh, and now you're moving up. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's now, happening, right? right? You're buying a new house? Which maybe isn't the best time to buy a house right now. Why not? Well, it, it's the best time to sell a house, so sure. they go hand in hand. It's yeah. very nice to have both. Yeah, All for right. sure. All right. Now, why am I having you guys on the show? Because you are my tech gurus. And I was on the 404, and I said, you got to come on the podcast mm-hmm. and help me out and with the just the general trends What's the thing you guys are like? What do I have to know about? Mm. Because I I don't want to pay attention to anything in technology unless you say I have to pay attention okay. to it. Okay. All right. I so got some stuff. Here's yeah, my question too. for you: Is Snap worth thirty five billion dollars? <laughs> I I don't know. I I don't think so. Are you a Snapchatter? I used to be more active on Snapchat, but now I switched back to. Don't look at me like for I'm like crazy. six months were you active? No, on Snapchat? I, was, I would say like a year, okay. a solid year. I was I was on the Snappies, but now yeah. I'm back on the Insties. Oh, you're back on the gram, yeah. right? Because uh, they pretty much copied Snapchat's uh, best feature mm-hmm. and did it better. Yeah. Uh, the only thing that Instagram doesn't do is the facial recognition sort of stuff, which yeah. they'll do, right. I'm sure, eventually. But it, it's a better program. Mm-hmm. And I already have an, an existing relationship with Instagram, as do many people, maybe uh, not of my generation, but... What do you mean about that? What are you saying, my generation? Well, just saying, like, like, you know, Snapchat is more of, like, a, a millennial it, thing, it, and I'm yeah, on the younger. higher, higher, higher end of the millennial Do you just thing. get it squeak in under the, under the limit there? Yeah, yeah. The sand's running out of I that. think I'm probably right on the edge. It depends on who I'm you 33. ask. It depends on what demographic... And I think I'm I'm not a millennial, but I think I'm close. My wife probably is. She's 28. So. Yeah, she's a millennial. I've heard 1980. I've heard 1985. I'm 82. So the rule of thumb that I've always gone by is if you were born and remember a time where the internet was not a thing, so like you didn't use it in school and stuff like that, if you remember that period of time, I don't think you're a millennial. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, Mark, I'm not a millennial. <laughs> breaking my nose. <laughs> breaking news i remember dial phones uh let me ask you a question about the snap first yeah because it because us are you a user of the snap no i've really really tried <laughs> I, and so this relates to like the value of the company i think snap was designed very intentionally to be opaque to people that have been using the internet for a very long time and very relatively easy for kids to get into so the really tricky thing is can Snapchat maintain this audience with kids? Kids are abandoning uh, Facebook. Facebook has become an old ground, and, and Snapchat is where kids go. But can uh, Snapchat evolve to the point where they maintain this audience in the way that like MTV has always tried to maintain the younger audience and just let the other audiences go to like VH1 and whatever? I think it's, from a long-term perspective, very difficult for Snapchat to maintain that audience without building a much more casual audience. So I think it, I agree with Jeff. I think they're overvalued. 158 million daily 
active users. Yeah, but they can't grow. Mm. But let they're me ask you, forgetting growing. about that, but what are those people buying? If they're 19, they're not. what are they, like, they how no do money. you monetize them? Well, they, they have no money. But you're, you're getting impressions, right? You, right. You, you know, video impressions especially, which are which have value to well, them. But the only thing they're able to sell are those discovery pack sure. things that you get by swiping four times to the left. The discovery section of Snapchat is also not viewed as much sure. or used as much right. as the other I, features. I think the assumption is, especially when it comes to Silicon Valley, like startups, stuff like that, you know, you build this audience with a very, like, nice, uh, welcoming product, and then as revenue hawks start coming in, that's when you start levering, uh, leveraging all these, uh, you know, things, that are throwing in more ads, mid-roll, stuff like that. You've seen that on Facebook already mm-hmm. happen. And I think a year or two from now, Snapchat will start pushing that stuff further and further towards the front. And I, do more of like the sponsored face goggle Don't you think thing. it would be money. so much fun if the whole thing fell apart? I, I mean, mean there would be sort of like a funny, like, I mean, it's not going to. I mean, that's Twitter enough, though. Or, like Twitter yeah, for, forever to, was. lost two thirds of its value since yeah. the IPO. I mean, I know, that's crazy. insane. But, but that's the thing. Twitter is a utility more than a product. Uh, Snapchat, I don't think is a utility. So that would kind of contradict my point of like them not being able to turn a profit, mm. but I just don't. I see it more of like as a fad than an actual ecosystem the way Facebook is. What's the next new thing, guys? What do I need to know? What's the next thing I'm not going to use? <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about like an app? Yeah, that's t- the app stuff is tough. I mean, I I'm I want to know like what's going to happen to Uber. Uh, I think Uber has a lot of baggage in terms of their brand and stuff like that. So that I th- I mean, I was just in San Francisco and I literally did not use Uber once. I used Lyft. The whole time, yeah, and a lot of that has to do with their brand and and their perception that they're putting out there, and it's it's pretty gross. And then again, I mean, like I feel bad for the cab drivers, but it's not as if, as if they've been the most professional group in no, many of these cities. I think there's a legacy there of like uh, complacency. Yeah, there was and, no accountability. There was no review system for yeah. your cab driver. Right. And 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 I think if anything, that's the big benefit of Uber's introduction into the market is that well now everyone has to really sort of grow up mm-hmm. a little bit. All right. What else do I need to worry about? Do I need to worry about robots taking um, our, all of our jobs? Are you guys I loving don't... the robot action here? <laughs> I'm very paranoid when it comes to that. Yeah. Really? Well, yeah. they're not going to take the job of podcast. No, I realize that. Uh, yeah. Big assumption. <laughs> yeah. Big but assumption. Uh, <laughs> Siri. But like the most uh, the most popular job in America, they're going to take probably and truck driver. That I mean, I I think fleets of tr- like the second Walmart does it which I think has the biggest fleet in America. Mm-hmm. Second, they do it where they're like, oh, these robots have mm. killed less people than humans. Yeah. That's going to really change the face of employment in the country. But you do agree that like we are decades away from being in a situation. I don't where know if we're decades. Maybe a decade. Sure. Yeah. I think like I, the transition of, of moving from manual to automatic mm. is not going to be smooth. And there is probably going to be like a five year period where it's like, mm, maybe maybe we just don't go anywhere. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. Just, let's let the dust settle. Yeah. Uh, but I do think the second, you know, Walmart falls in line and another big fleet of trucks fall in line with autonomous uh, uh, trucks. Yeah. But I there's mean, always going to be someone in the car, don't you think? I don't know. I was like, just going to ask that. Like if the car breaks down, like you're in Route 66 in the middle of the desert, and the car breaks down, like it pulls over, yeah, right? and, and then, then calls like, a, the a robot, drone to come fix it. The, robot the drone comes in. And the drone comes and drops <laughs> your spare tire yeah. or something. <laughs> like, like UPS is going to roll out yeah, yeah, a drone yeah. delivery service. So there's still a truck driver, right. but the truck driver doesn't deliver the package to the front door. It's that last leg of delivery that's the most yeah. cost inefficient for UPS. The really? stopping and. The st- and it's going. like yeah. sending it across the country, routing it through hubs. That's all gravy. Yeah. They make tons of money on efficiency, but it's the last leg of that delivery where UPS is like, you know, hemorrhaging money. So it's, it's like many... it's like you you have the guy with the um the t shirt gun at, yeah. in the arena. Essentially, it's like, boom, yeah. and that your your stuff comes to you just like that. Basically, except it'll hopefully be gingerly landed by a drone. Uh, we got autonomous <laughs> driving. <laughs> Yeah. Vehicles. We have the death of these poor truck. What are these truckers going to do? Build the, the no. robots? The, no. Oh, maybe. But yeah, who, who builds the robots? The robots probably build the so robots. So they're out of work. That's a cliched answer. I don't have an answer for that. I. <laughs> What are the coal miners going to do? I don't yeah, know. Sure. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's the issue that we're running into. And and we go through these periods of time where it's like this industry no longer has a purpose. The service industry is that's where a lot of these jobs are going. Yeah. It's just a question of like, is there a one to one ratio of like as many jobs are being no, lost? There's not. 
This is Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. We'll get back to the interview with Russ Freshdick and Jeff Bacalar in a second, but interesting to discuss how industries have to find their purpose, right? We go through various iterations and no better example of that than financial services. You know, it used to be 150 million years ago when I entered the financial services industry, there were these things called stockbrokers and they charged you a boatload of money to sell you a big mutual fund and had a commission and, you know, it, it, the commission could be as much as eight and a quarter percent. Honestly, in my mind, even just five years ago, to imagine that you could have your assets managed for a quarter of one percent on an annual basis, that would have been mind-blowing to just bring that up with anybody. And guess what? Our sponsor, Betterment, does just that. Now, you may have heard of Betterment. We talk about it all the time here. It's the largest independent online financial advisor. And Betterment has low transparent advisory fees compared to those big traditional services. And when you think about it, so much of innovation has been pegged to technology. And Betterment has technology that helps make your investing easier. You can track your investments without being confused or frustrated. Betterment believes that managing your wealth should be easy. When you go to Betterment.com, you're going to provide them with some information. And then you get tailored recommendations on decisions like how much to invest, how much risk to take in your portfolio, and the type of investment account you should have. Right now, Better Off listeners can get up to six months managed for free. For more information, visit Betterment.com slash Better Off. Betterment, rethink what your money can do. And now back to our interview with Russ and Jeff. What do I need to know about VR mm. and AI? Check whoa, out. Whoa, whoa, why did you say well, those AI. two don't really go hand in hand? I, I mean, AR? Because I like to, no, artificial intelligence. Okay. And virtual reality? And virtual reality. Those are two completely different. Yeah. I know. What do I need to know about each <laughs> of them? Which order? Let's start. Let's do uh, VR. Okay. okay. So, so VR, right? I, check I, out. Yeah. I mean, I feel like right now the temperature on that's pretty lukewarm. Um, and falling. And oh, falling. Really? Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, Good. just just for some inside baseball, uh, VR interest on CNET has tanked. It, really? It never yeah. really was super high for us either. Yeah. And it's, but it's only like fallen off a cliff since. Why is that? Uh, I think it's because so many people get the idea of it. They've seen videos of it, but they aren't willing to buy the hardware. And at this point, they're just like, well, Okay, I get it. It's like not a world changing thing like everyone thought it was going to be. I love it. I think it's super cool. But from a broad perspective, like it needs to be the size of my glasses yeah. before it's com- it has any viability. By it's the way, completely... those are not small glasses. No, either. they're not. No. So, we're so we're close. We're, we're close getting there. there. It's completely impractical. Uh, you need to invest thousands of dollars to, to yeah. from scratch to, to get going yeah. with it. A thousand dollars is the low end. A thousand dollars. And PlayStation has one for their PS4 system, which well, you can uh, do in mobile. You can do mobile stuff for cheaper, uh, like five hundred bucks. Yeah, but if mobile. you want like full immersion with controllers and stuff like that, you're you're looking at you know a thousand bucks. PSVR, the PlayStation VR one, is okay, hmm. but it's you know that sort of ran out of steam too. Yeah. Hmm. Virtual reality crossing it right off my list. Yeah. I mean, Thank I God, just, something I don't have to deal with. This check is back great. in four years. All right, I'll be back with you. Let's talk a little bit about artificial intelligence. Okay. I, I have some friends who are in medical research, mm-hmm. and they talk a lot about the application of AI in medicine as sure. being like the coolest freaking sure. thing. Or as my friend says, this is how radiologists are going to go out of business. Mm-hmm. Or like that, like it's really sort of a like an amazing thing that, that they're starting to see already the investment in artificial intelligence to enhance what human beings do. I, I, for the radiologists out there, relax. <laughs> I'm not, I'm just kidding. But but that plays into the same conversation we had about robots yep. and, and uh, automation. Uh, everyone worries about going for a second opinion on something. Well, what if you had the opinion of every doctor ever who yep. ever existed right away? And it's a diagnostic tool, yeah. right? Yes. So there's something kind of cool that um, I think is intriguing and was somehow using all of this amazing artificial intelligence, mm-hmm. but with like the human ability to kind of parse through, sure. right? Yeah, and so it, it could make your your office visit to the doctor a lot more quicker and mm-hmm. more efficient. I think uh, the big things are like machine learning, which is just like using AI to, as you said, parse through all this data, and then you could have a human at the end say, "Okay, it's either this, this, or this." 
Um, and also for cert- the implication on surgery is crazy. Um, having, you know, s- human guided, but still effectively, they were already using this, but effectively you have AI controlling a scalpel in an incredibly detailed procedure where a human could never, ever do that. I mean, laser eye surgery already uses stuff like this. So like, they're absolutely right. The implications for medicine are, are crazy. What about other areas, Jeff? Um, I think home automation stuff is going to be the most practical thing that people are exposed to in the immediate future. Um, you kind of have to dictate how much of your life and home is going to in, you know, involve that. But I think a lot of the digital assistant stuff, uh, your Alexas, your Google Homes, the Echo, that kind of stuff, I think is going to play a major role uh, in people's first experience with some kind of artificial intelligence. It's, it's approachable, it's accessible, mm-hmm. surface level stuff, but it's still impressive tech. Are you a Siri Alexa kind of household? Not yet. When I get a house, I'll probably wire that baby up. Yeah. What about we, you, Russ? We have an Echo, yeah. so that's the Alexa. And? And I love it. I think it's great. Uh, well, it's. I don't want her talking to me. I got well, a lot don't of talk to her. in my head. She won't yeah. talk to you if you don't talk to her. So so how, tell me how you use it on sure. a day-to-day so, basis. So I use it day-to-day. Like, I'm leaving the house. I'm, like, getting breakfast and whatever. And I can just say, Alexa, what's the weather? And I'll get the weather. Uh, so I do that. I uh, say, like, uh, you know, I'll have uh, Alexa play Spotify for me. Um there's a lot of stuff that, like, I would do if I wasn't, like, on the couch and relaxing and my phone's far away from me and I'm being lazy so I can just, like, cue up music or whatever. I don't do the whole thing where, like, the lights turn on. And, like, you could but go you to that extent if you wanted to. You, no, no more clapper. <laughs> yeah, you just say, Alexa, I'm home yeah, or whatever. Yeah, Alexa, water the lawn. Yeah. Alexa. You could do that stuff. Maybe you can – I'm sure – so that's the cool thing is that it's open – it's kind of open source. Yeah. So people who make smart things, like – appliances and other junk for your house they can talk to alexa so she can learn like it's a person she can learn these things called skills yep. like the cnet news skill yep. which will play my voice just jeff i could so i could just say the you name say, and jeff appears before no, me, i'm like serious Jeannie. like the thing i record <laughs> something for cnet every day that goes to to yep. echo there's which a Jeopardy fun. app, a skill, which is very cool. You can listen to all the Jeopardy questions from the day before and all try to them? answer them. I think it's all of them. Wow. Wow. On one hand, I'm sort of thrilled, and on the other hand, I'm sort of frightened. Eh, what I are think, you afraid of? I don't know. People listening? Old, I don't know. I guess I'm like, I feel like it's sort of intrus- intrusive in one way, except you're right. You control it. Yeah, you, um, you get what you I put I feel into like it. it's like... You can sort of be really lazy, and I'm already oh, lazy. Oh, yeah. You you're can not, definitely. You know? You're not lazy. You're well, up every morning at 3 a.m. I know, you're but not. I'm just saying that, like, you know, I could be, I could ride that couch. <laughs> I'm sure you can. Siri, Alexa, Jeff, could you play me the next thing? On I wouldn't even have to hit the next episode it. button. It would just go. I just find that there are instances where, like, music, for example, I, I'm at home relaxing. And I was like, oh, I could listen to some, some music. And then it would, like, leave my mind. And I wouldn't think about it. But because it's so easy, I can like do that and be on to doing other things. It's, it makes me more productive. Will Will either Siri or Alexa cook dinner for me? Mm. Not yet. That but we'll awesome. order you Domino's if yeah. that's, that's your thing. Awesome. I'll easily order. You. Uh, I just want you to see Mark grimacing. What a world. He is so old-fashioned. So he, he's very- Mark's a Luddite? He's a total Luddite. Was it the Domino's that put him off? I don't know. Domino's puts First of all, Domino's would put him off anyway. Yeah. He's Italian-American. Yeah, so come on. He's the guy who like runs around Times Square yelling at people who are in the Olive Garden. Oh, you're wasting, <laughs> you're wasting he your says, time. He'll say to them, he says, you are in New York. Have pizza, for God's yeah. sakes. Yeah, you're wasting your time, Mark. All right, before we finish up, let's have a little homage to Apple. Mm. Okay. So here, remember when I went from a four to a six and you guys laughed at me? Yeah, because yeah, you waited sure. way too wait long. Wait too Do I have to- What is that? That's a six? Six. Okay. Do I have to go good? to an eight? Maybe. It couldn't hurt. I, I don't think you would necessarily notice because I don't think you're doing anything super intensive on your phone. I think when you jump every two years, I think that's kind of the move. Yeah. Is that, to get a new phone every two but years. But I think that's like the most techy. I mean, technically you could do it every year, but like I think- I think two years is even probably overkill for you, Jill. Okay. I think every three years would be fine. Uh, you're not going to run into an issue where your phone's not working anymore by the end of th- like 
that's about the end of the life cycle. I, I like that. I like that. Lately, I don't know when it happened, but like you can get by now with like the last three iPhones. Yeah, like you can have that's a pretty five, good, right? And be okay. Even a 4S is probably okay right now. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you struggling might start, a little yeah. bit. But like you can kind of make it work with a, with an iPhone 5. Uh, you know what's interesting? Uh, I am addicted to it. I remember when Jeff and I said to you, should I get an Android mm-hmm. when I was going to get this? And you're like, nah. Yeah. Just... I, I mean, I use an Android and I told you not. <laughs> you did. Yeah. You did. Yeah. Um, all right. You ready for your last question here? Yeah, I'm nervous. You went from the beginning. We said your best financial decision. Yeah. Now your worst financial Ooh. decision. Jeff, you go first. Oh, man. The worst financial decision I ever... Getting a credit card in college. Oh, oh yeah. That's a bad one. I mean, it had a small limit, but uh, I got there yeah. quick. Mm. Russ? Uh, yeah. So during my sojourns trying a variety of different jobs a couple years ago, I uh, started at a startup company. And this is not devastating by any means, but essentially I negotiated for more options because I really thought there was a big future there and ended up losing a fair bit of money because they sold but they totally screwed over all the common stockholders Uh. so again not devastating i've never been like crushed by financial decision but like frustrating you know that sucks yeah whatever it happens it happens sometimes life happens it does jeff bacalar of the longest running podcast in CNET history. Just say history everywhere. Yeah. In the It'll history just of, the, true. of the universe. It's an alternate we fact. Will force, we It'll will happen. force it into truth. You can follow Jeff at Jeff Bacalar. Check out CNET.com and the 404 podcast yes. where he is the host. As is Russ. As is Russ Frushtick at Russ Frushtick. And that's the traditional spelling of Frushtick. Of course. <laughs> from the shtetl. You all would know that. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. Of course. Sure, sure. So much fun, and uh, we'll give you many, many more opportunities to come back. Lovely. Excellent. Yeah, totally. (laughs) You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Okay, it's time for the listener question of the week. Now, remember, you've got two chances every week to get on the air here at Better Off. On Tuesdays, we do the Better Off bonus call of the week. Then we do this portion on our longer show, which drops on Thursdays. You have a number of ways to get in touch with us. You can email us, askjill at betteroffpodcast.com. You can always tweet your question at Jill on Money, hashtag better off. Right now, we are going to talk to Yoni, who's on the line from New York City. Hey, Yoni, welcome to Better Off. What can I do for you? Hi, Jill. So great to be here. So I uh, work for a small business, and I've been trying to figure out ways to save for retirement. I'm 27, and uh, I grew up in New York City. I don't have any student debt, thank God, but I do have a mortgage. And um, because I work for such a small business, they don't offer any retirement benefits. Now, I do teach part-time at uh, the City University of New York, which offers a 403B benefit. Mm -hmm. So I actually contribute about half of my earnings from my teaching towards a 403B, and I'm also maxing out a Roth IRA every year. But when I add all that up, and uh, it still doesn't really reach the goal that I'm trying to get for retirement, which I have read should be about 15% of my gross income. And I'm wondering if there are any other ways I could save for retirement and or save in generally that would be um, ideally structured. Uh, Yoni, could you put more than 50% of those earnings into the 403B? Yes, I technically could. But um, I thought about doing that because I, I originally started doing just a third mm-hmm. and then I went to half this semester. Um, I can go up to the full amount, which would just get me there. Mm-hmm. But I don't know, like mentally, if I could go in and teach, you know, um, three hours a week <laughs> at night and then not, not see any difference in my checking account. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. But do you need the money to I mean, because there's two questions. One is, you know, could you do it? So now we know, yes, you could. But the second question is, do you need the cash flow? In other words, if that money goes if that were diverted into retirement savings Mm -hmm. would you miss it would it be tight for you to make your monthly bills no it wouldn't honestly it wouldn't um all right then here's the deal all right i know you're gonna hate me for this you know what i'm gonna say you i mean look if you really want to do that 
get that that retirement savings pumping and get going, then yeah, put it into the 403B because it's not, you know, you've got to shift your mindset a little bit. It's not that you're working for free. It's that, oh my God, how great is this? I am working and with the government's help, I am reaching my retirement goals. As long as you don't need the money for cash flow, if you really do want to crank on your retirement savings, that's the way to do it. If you know, because otherwise, we're sort of playing kabuki here, right? Because the other choice would be, okay, well, maybe you don't do that, and you take your 15 shekels that you make after tax that you know you're earning that's not going into your 403b, and then you let the government tax it, and then you invest it in some non-retirement account. I mean, it's really not the most efficient way to get what you right. want. I think that if you can just reframe it to yourself, then I think you're in better shape. And I think you know the answer to this, which is why I think it's adorable that you called me because I think you knew all along that I was going to be like, <laughs> mean old Aunt Jill is telling me, you know, to do this. But I, I really, I think you know the answer to this. And um, so I am going to reiterate what I think you already know, which is, Put the money into the 403B, get your retirement savings up, and unless you really need that money to live on, that is the smartest way for you to proceed. Well, thank you very much for the hard truth talk. Um, (laughs) I was wondering if you think my goal is appropriate, if that 15% mark is the right goal to have. You know, look, I always say the right goal is as much as you can possibly bear. Um, Mm -hmm. At 15 percent in your late 20s is a great goal. Frankly, if we could get more and more 20 somethings putting at least 15 percent in, we would probably eradicate the retirement savings crisis in the United States. So I think you're right in it. It's great. You don't have debt. This is the time to do it. You know, in terms of, you you know, you've got a mortgage, right? So you own an apartment. um, and, And so life's pretty good. It sounds to me like you really are in a place where you can do this. So you should. I think so. (laughs) I know. Hold your nose and do it. Thanks. And I was um, wondering if you had any advice about approaching um, my employer about offering retirement benefits. I mean, look, how many people work in the in the organization? We are two employees plus the owner. Yeah. Tiny. It's, that's tiny. I know it's tough. Uh, well, I mean, how do I guess the question is to ask is the is the owner a young person like you? No, she has she founded the business about thirty years ago. Really? So mm-hmm. how does she save for retirement? I wonder. <laughs> that's a good question. She doesn't retire. I think is the trick. <laughs> oh God. Um. You know, there are easier ways for her to set up a retirement account that um, she might be interested in and something, um, you know, that she could potentially try to do a simple IRA, which is um, might want to investigate that and, you know, see if she could be interested in that. Some small businesses, what they'll do is the owner will do is say, look, I I don't want to deal with a retirement plan, but I'll pay you really well. And so you Mm. can go do your own. So maybe there's a case to be made that, in fact, you know, look, we don't have a retirement. Do you have do you have health insurance? No. <laughs> wow. So you got your health insurance through your partner? No, I went on bought on the exchanges. Oh, okay. All right, good. You know, it, it would be nice if she could do a little bit more um in terms yeah. of retirement. So maybe it's a maybe it's a way that you think about even your own compensation that you know mm-hmm. that how much it's costing you to buy your health insurance and you know that you're putting money away and that you know maybe this is something you use as a a way of negotiating a higher salary. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Good luck to you, Mr. Yoni. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for calling and um to hold that nose and put that money into retirement, okay? <laughs> Thank you very much, Joe. I think I will. Thanks so much to Russ and Jeff for joining us on the program today. Don't forget, we've got our bonus episode that comes out on Tuesdays and the longer form every single Thursday. You can subscribe via iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have any questions or suggestions, you can find me on Twitter. My handle is at Jill on Money. That's at Jill on Money. Just use the hashtag better off. You can also reach me via email. Ask Jill at betteroffpodcast.com. That's Ask Jill at betteroffpodcast.com. And if you wouldn't mind, please leave us a review or a rating in iTunes. It really will help us out. Better Off is sponsored by Betterment. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Delercio produces. I'm Jill Schlesinger. See you next week. <laughs>